Good morning and welcome to Studio Time with Deb, the online version. Today we are going to be talking about creating stability for soldering. So those of you who have taken my class for a long time, uh, you know that I love to solder. I just think soldering is so much fun. I love when it works and most of the time it does. But even when it doesn't work, it's like a personal challenge. You know, I want to, I want to, I'm going to make it work. So I have to figure out how to make it work and what went wrong with that one. So I don't do that again. So I love to teach soldering too. And especially the, the, the nuances, the, the little things that you don't normally hear about. So today we're going to be talking about a lot of those things. I want to go over some of the overall basics of soldering number one. And then we're going to get into more specifics about creating stability. So one thing about soldering is, um, and I see this all the time, where people stack up this, this really precarious, precarious stack of things. And then they go into solder it. And the first time they touch it, it all crumbles like a Jenga game. Um, so we want to talk about that because that is not a good way to try to solder. If you try to solder and you've got things, you know, barely, barely holding themselves together, um, you're pretty much guaranteed to have a problem. Something's going to fall apart, something's going to shift, something's going to move. So we want to talk about how to hold these parts in place. Um, one of the things you can do to hold parts in place, and I didn't really address this in the lecture so much, but I will address it right now, is to build things in components. So if you build a bezel with a step with some decoration around it, and then you build a forged um, element and um, I don't know, a roller printed element, you put those together, and then you attach those two together. What you can do is use hard solder as you build the components and then do medium to put them together. So working in components is one way to do it. And that's also much easier to make them stable as you're soldering. Because when you start lining up four solder joints that are all different levels and different thicknesses and different um, everything else, that, it, that makes it very difficult to line things up. So if you do them one at a time, that really helps. The other thing that's gonna really help with stability and, and um, making things work is to tack things. And what I mean by that is that if I have a bezel and I wanna put a wire on it that goes like this, I can tack one side, leave this side free. Don't try to do two joints at once, do one joint. And then what you can do is you can move this one around even after this joint is done. Worst that can happen is it's gonna break. But if you get it close, then you can make it be perfectly fit and then you can solder down here and get the other one done. So what that does is that it just buys you a little bit of of um, that you can move it around, you can change things. You don't have to do it all at once. Um, so those are things to think about when you're setting up. Overall basics for soldering. I wanna do the very, very, very basics first. Uh, you need it, uh, of equipment that you need and, and what you need. So you need a heat resistant area. And one of the things that I use is a hardy board backer, um, backer boards. They're used usually for showers and whatnot in bathrooms when you're going to put tile on top of them. Um, they're basically cement boards. And I usually put that down as the bottom layer. It doesn't conduct heat very well. You don't want to solder directly on top of that, but it'll protect a wood table or a different table um, or just be something, a, a surface that won't catch on fire when you're putting other things on top of it. Uh, ceramic tile can work. I want to give you a warning about working on ceramic tiles. You never work directly on one, never. But even with a fire brick on one, if you heat ceramic tiles unevenly, they're going to crack and break and they can really shatter and kind of throw ceramic at you. Um, I don't recommend ceramic tiles. They can be okay as long as you're going to work on something else. So you work on fire bricks or on another surface. A lot of times, if, if I had ceramic tile as my basis to work on, as my base, I would um, put down probably a solderite board and then a fire brick on top of it, just to give me protection from that. Um, and then you can also use a fire brick lined table, and I'm going to show you that in a little bit. So that's what I do. Fire bricks are not that horribly expensive, and I just lined a table. And it doesn't have to be a big table; it can be fairly small. And I'll talk to you about possibilities with that too. You need decent ventilation. Um, if you have a window nearby, you can put a fan sucking away, a fan blowing out the window. 
um, if you have the wherewithal to do it and the, the space and the everything else, you can put a ventilating fan in either in the wall or like a cooking fan, a really good cooking fan up above the space. You want it to pull the fumes away from you. So it needs to be in front of you or above you, but not directly above. Directly, it needs to be above you, but in front so that it pulls the fumes away from your face. It's mostly the flux fumes that we're worried about. That's what you need to worry most, unless you're burning off some nasty plating, which I don't recommend you do. Uh, you need to be able to dim your lighting at least a little bit. So you don't want to solder under super bright light. Uh, it makes it hard to see the colors, the metals turning and everything else. You also don't want it to be dark. It needs to be a little bit on the dim side, but not, uh, not dark. Because if it's dark, you're only going to see the metal's going to turn red. You're going to think it's going to melt any second, and really it's not. So not dark, not super lit up, but somewhere there in the middle. Fire extinguisher. You should have a fire extinguisher just in case. I've never needed one for soldering, but knock on wood, but you should have one and it should be ready to go. And for any of you using acetylene, I don't know about propane, but I know acetylene, you need a carbon monoxide detector. So carbon monoxide detectors will detect acetylene if it's leaking and acetylene is lighter than air, it'll rise in the room. So if you mount it up fairly high, if you've got a, a decent acetylene leak, it's going to let you know. And that's a good thing to know. And that's a good thing to put in your studio. Okay, I'm going to start slides. All right. So this is me building the um, solder tables I've got in the student room right now. This is right here is the Hardy backer board. And these are fire bricks. These are half fire bricks. You can get fire bricks in lots and lots of sizes. Uh, you can get them half size, full size, um, all kinds of things. So these are fire bricks that are half size and I use them to line the table only. And then we'll use real fire bricks or other things on top of these. This is what it looks like finished. And I think I went with full size when I finally did it because I wanted it a little taller. So these are full size bricks on here and they are on top of a hardy backer board. And then there's full size bricks here that we'll solder on top of. So I wanna remind you about a few things when we're talking about, I'm gonna talk about surfaces to solder on. So what I wanna remind you about is the temperatures of the things that we mostly do. So hard silver solder is 1425 to 1450. And I give it a range because it depends on who you buy it from. Um, some you know, different companies have different alloys and you may not have noticed that, you may have noticed that, uh, but not all hard solders are the same. And it's same with medium. They're not all the same and they're not all the same temperature. It is important that you know what, what, it, what you've got because if you look at this, if you've got the 1390 of the medium and the 1425 of the hard, that's not much temperature difference. You really want to buy yourself more difference than that if you can. So, um, so you just need to know what you've got. So you can, if you buy it from Rio, then it, I think theirs is pretty much always the same. Uh, but, and they'll tell you what the, the melting point and the flow points are. These are flow points. Uh, easy solder is about 1325. Sterling silver melts at 1640 and fine silver at 1761. That means if you're melting um, fine silver balls, you need to know that that's getting up to above 1761 in order to do that. And solderite boards won't take it. I'll show you. These are flame temperatures that I just want you to know. This is Fahrenheit over here, so we'll pay attention to that. Most of you have acetylene, you're at 4,300 degrees, thereabouts, 4,350. Um, if you have propane, that, then you're at about 4,000 degrees. Um, most of you don't use butane, but if you do, similar temperatures. And these are the, I, I will go over these as we go through them, but this is the recommended temperature for each item that you would solder on. So fire bricks, the K23, and also it's called IN23, I think, is 2300 degrees. 
Magnesia block is 2,000, honeycomb block 2,000. Solderite boards top out at 1,700. Uh, Kaiser Lee board 2,100. Platinum related solder boards 3,000. That's the highest ones, but they're pricey. I'll talk to you about those. And what vermiculite, about, sorry? What about charcoal? Charcoal blocks? Charcoal doesn't have, charcoal catches on fire. I mean, it's, it doesn't really have a, um, it catches on fire long before you need to worry about its temperature. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I looked for a temperature. It's whatever wood burns at, uh, but it'll take higher than that. So I, charcoal's kind of, I couldn't find any reference for a temperature on that one. But I will talk about charcoal. Uh, vermiculite I have not used, but I've seen the Rio one and I bought one. So I'll play with it later and I'll let you know if I find out anything different than what I'm going to share with you. Okay, fire bricks. Fire bricks are from, oh, oh, I want to back up. So, any, any surface that you're working on, that you're soldering on, that gets messed up, you need to save the bits and pieces. That's one of the things that's really important because you can use those as props. You can use those to put under things. You can use those to um, use as heat sinks. You can do all kinds of stuff with it. So save your bits and pieces when things break and they will break. So here's the considerations you need to think about when you're deciding what surface you want to solder on. It, how much heat is reflected back into the piece? How much material in the material can serve as a heat sink? Some of them can serve really well as a heat sink, which is really nice that it can help you out. Uh, I did at, in research find one person who is soldering on a regular red brick. Don't do that. That is really dangerous. If you get that good and hot in one little area, if it has a lot of moisture in it, it's going to crack and break and shatter and be a mess. So, and plus it's a heat sink. I don't know how you can heat anything up on a red brick, so don't use those. Uh, other considerations, you need to know how long it lasts, how messy it is, how much it costs, how difficult is it to get. Some of these are really hard to find. They're hard to get. Um, and then how soft or carvable or um, changeable is it in case you need to do that. So these are kiln bricks. And uh, kiln bricks, I get the ones only made in the USA. Uh, I got a batch one year for Idlewild that were made in China, and they were not as soft, extremely porous, and really hard to work with. Um, these that are made in the USA seem to be fine, and it's the K23 or IN23. Um, 2300 degrees is their, supposed to be their maximum temperature. You can get them from Ceramic Supply or eBay. Um, so Aardvark or Freeform Supply, uh, Freeform Ceramic down in San Diego. Aardvark is in Santa Ana, I believe. Um, I'll show you the Aardvark. Here we go. This is Aardvark, and this is the one that I like, and they call it the IN23, and that's a full-size brick. Um, they're soft. They can be cut. They can be filed. They can be sanded down. If they get um, too pockmarked, you can, you can either take a saw and cut them down or you can take two of them and sand them together. Don't breathe the dust. Wear a respirator when you do it. Uh, and then save all the bits and pieces for fire bricks especially. They can be used for props and for all kinds of stuff. So you'll want a little, um, I use a little metal bread tin that I can throw them in. And this is one reason I like fire bricks. So this is a stone setting. It's for a square stone. And see how I can pin into the brick? I can just pin into it. They're cheap enough that I, they're a throwaway item, right? But pinning into this, see how stable this is? This is not going anywhere. And there's no heat sink. I just need to solder this top little joint up here and then all is well. And there it is on a ring. But this is another reason I really like it is because I can put T pins in it and uh, floral pins. These are floral pins. I want you to notice over here, to hold this, in the, this earring in the right position, I have a piece of broken brick. And that broken brick broke off in kind of a triangle and I can take it and shove it up that thing so that it holds it so that it won't rock back when I'm trying to solder. So that it holds this down flat on the fire brick. And this is a pencil lead that's holding these two little tubes in place so that I can solder them on right there. 
So fire brick reflects heat back into the piece, but it also is a really good heat sink, um, which means on this part right here, by having it rest on the fire brick, I, if I heat directly on it and I get the fire brick around it good and hot right there next to it, that's going to work really well. And then these two won't tend to heat up as much if I don't heat them directly, if I only heat over in here. So fire brick is kind of one of my go-tos. I like it. This is another one. So this is a prong setting that I was doing. And um, I drilled the holes, put the prongs in, and then this is looking at the back of it. So on the, the front, the other side, the prongs go down into the kite. This is a Kaiser Lee board, but could be a fire brick also. I need some of the prongs sticking up on the back side because if I don't have some prongs sticking up on the back side, I can't get enough heat into the prong to solder them. So I have to have that. So I have that sticking up. This is what it looked like from the front after it was done. And this is the back. So I wanna show you, so I soldered on the back and, but it had a texture, a heavy texture on it. And as you can see, I was able to fake the texture back in when I cleaned it up. So what I did was to take a burr and I just made burr marks that looked like the texture that was on it on top of where I cleaned up the prongs. So then you can't really see where the prongs were soldered on. This is Kaiser Lee board and it was, it's used mostly for slumping glass. You'll, you'll, if you look it up, that's what you'll see. It's the glass places that have it and sell it and do all that. And they cut out shapes and then slump glass into it. Uh, it'll take 2,100 degrees, which is higher than most of the boards we work with. It is extremely soft. Uh, like you can mash it with your thumb, no problem. So it's really nice for pinning things into it. Pins beautifully. Uh, this is what Joanna Goldberg uses. It comes in different thicknesses. It comes in different sizes. It tends to be a little bit pricey, but it holds up pretty well. Um, this is a Joanna Goldberg setup. And this is why she uses it, because you can take it and you can pin all these things in it and then just go zip, 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 zip and do all the solder joints. You can cut it. You can, um, I've taken pieces of it and wadded it up to make something to support things while I'm soldering. Um, you don't want to breathe the dust. It's not good dust to breathe, but it's, um, it is workable. It's, I don't, it's something I think you should have in your studio. Charcoal blocks. Let's talk charcoal blocks. Uh, charcoal blocks come in hard and soft. Hard ones are also called compressed. Um, the soft ones should be bound with wire. Let me show you that right there. They should be bound with wire. If they're not bound with wire, they're going to tend to crack and break and fall apart. Um, charcoal blocks, when you heat them up, they get very, very hot and they often, especially the not compressed ones, they're going to catch on fire. And when they do, um, typically they don't, it's not a flame fire, it's just like embers. Uh, but you need to put that out because if you don't, what's, and not as you're soldering, finish your solder joint, do whatever it is you're doing. And then when you finish, you need to put that out. Otherwise, it's going to just eat away your charcoal block. And charcoal blocks tend to be a little bit pricey. Uh, I don't quench my charcoal blocks because I don't want them to get completely wet, especially if I want to use them again pretty soon. And also the temperature difference tends to crack the charcoal. But what you can do is to have a spray bottle of water nearby and you just squirt the thing a little bit. So bind it. And then that's what it looks like when it's on fire. <laughs> So you just want to squirt it with a little bit of water and make it not catch on fire. Charcoal blocks are wonderful because they cut down on oxidation and they do that by creating a um, reducing atmosphere. So as the organic, as the wood burns, it takes the oxygen from that, the area right around it. And that's why we can make nicer little balls on charcoal than you can on other surfaces. Uh, because it's an organic material. And so the reducing atmosphere really helps us. Solderite boards. Solderite boards uh, max out at 1700 degrees. So of all of the things we're working with, this one is the lowest temperature. That's something that's good to know. Comes in soft and hard, comes in different sizes and thicknesses. Uh, the soft ones can be pinned into and shaped and cut and everything else. 
the hard ones can be carved and drilled, but not so much pinned into. They're pretty hard. Um, I don't use these a lot. I would use a hard one as a liner for a fire brick. And then I also use the hard ones as um, uh, the surface that I do all of my fusing of um, fine silver when I'm making Roman chains. Uh, so when I do my Roman chains and I'm fusing the fine silver loops, I have solderite boards that I have never used flux on. They're still relatively pristine. You can see the, the little previous firing marks from little circles, but that's it. And uh, I've used that for a long time, but I have allocated it strictly for that. So I don't use it for anything else. So that works. Um, honeycomb blocks. These are ceramic blocks and they sell these little pins, which I, you don't need to buy the little pins. Uh, but the honeycomb blocks, one of the nice things about them is that T pins and floral pins fit into the little holes quite nicely and can hold things down. These are a little bit pricey. They break relatively easily. If you drop it or anything, it, it'll, it's going to break. Um, they do keep things super, super, super flat. So I know that um, I recently talked to somebody who was um, soldering a fine silver strip to gallery wire. And you want that to be flat, 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 have a flat surface that you can kind of gently pin them together to hold them, to hold them um, top to bottom, but that, that uh, or edge to edge. But you want a flat surface that they're on so that when that comes out, it is absolutely pristine flat. This is a good surface for that. This is a really good surface for that. Here's one. These are uh, just wire that was bent to hold things in place. T pins to hold something in place. This is a magnesia block and it maxes out at 2000 degrees. It's kind of like a hard version of a Kaiser Lee board. These are a little bit harder to find. Uh, not everybody has them. I don't use them a lot. They're soft. They're kind of porous. Um, I, they're kind of like halfway in between a fire brick and a Kaiser Lee board. So they can be easily shaped and pinned into, they can be carved, they can be cut. What did you say that was called? Magnesia, M-A-G-N-E-S-I-A. -E Magnesia board or block. Uh, and they're around, you'll see them. They, they, I, I don't remember if Rio carries one or not. I think they do. Oh, there's another honeycomb. Sorry, wrong order. So this is um, ceramic boards. I'm going to go back. Um, ceramic boards top out at 2000 degrees. They're very hard. They're very flat. You can clean them by sanding them. They're very dense. Um, you cannot shape them or carve them or pin into them. They're too dense. This is the vermiculite. Is it? Yes. And so you can see the vermiculite, it comes in a lot of sizes and shapes and they say that you can pin into it and you can carve it and everything else, but I, it seems really hard to me. It's harder than a fire brick, but I don't know. So this is a binding wire nest. And um, Claudia, this will be of particular interest to you. This is, so the way you make these, you can just make these. You take a uh, black anneal binding wire, and I like to use a relatively heavy gauge, um, I would say 16, 14, something like that. And this one I just wrapped and wrapped and wrapped on the end of a ring mandrel. And then I took it around and just formed it around. And then what you can do is to set something, you set this on top of a fire brick and you set something on top of it. And what you can do then is you can get the flame underneath it really easily. So it's a great way to do uh, things that you want to get underneath, but you want them supported a little bit. And it's a great little wad of metal to have in your, in your scrap bucket that you can, your soldering scrap bucket that you can drag out. And so if you need to heat underneath a piece more than on top, that's a great way to do it. And it doesn't have to be such a neat little bundle. Here's one that somebody did that's um, 
just a circle. Now, you know that when you solder something in the air like this, if you've ever soldered a prong setting, if you rest it on the fire brick, the part touching the fire brick is going to be the last thing to heat up. The stuff up in the air heats up a lot faster. And so if you're doing a bezel, which I would not recommend doing a bezel on this, but if you are, it's going to heat up way fast because it's just got air around it. It's got nothing taking, just these itty bitty wires taking a little bit of heat away. So this is going to heat up a lot faster than if that bezel is sitting on the fire brick. And it's just, you can make a mess of it like that. Just do a messy whatever. If your wire, your wire, so you can use black anneal binding wire that comes already black. You can use stainless wire. And if you do stainless wire, I recommend that you heat it up and blacken it. Uh, because if it's all nice and shiny, sometimes you can solder to it, which is not fun. Um, so, and don't use galvanized wire. If you use galvanized wire, that the, the galvanized part is just a plating and it burns off and that's nasty metals to burn off and it can burn off onto your silver if that's the first time you're doing it. So don't use galvanized wire at all. The fumes are bad too, really bad. This is Deb, what was the kind of wires you can use, the, not the galvanized stainless steel wire, what was the first one you said? Or black black wire? and steel binding wire. Okay, thank it's you. Called. Yeah, and you can get it, uh, the Home Depot or Lowe's or whoever will have that. It, it's very common. It's, I'm sure Amazon will have it. Just look up black anneal binding wire. You can get it in lots and lots of gauges. And I use a relatively heavy gauge. So this is a soldering tripod. I hate these things. I absolutely hate these things. Um, I don't know that I have maybe but once or twice used them that I haven't knocked them over. Um, so I don't use these very often and a couple of reasons. One is because I knock them over. Uh, another one is because this screen up top, see how heavy that screen is? That screen is a great heat sink. And if you do manage to get your metal too hot, you're going to have an imprint of that screen on the back side of your metal because it's going to heat and, and melt into it kind of unevenly. I don't love these. Sometimes I'll take a screen, I'll show you another one. So this one has a much finer screen. And sometimes I'll use one with a really fine screen. What I would be more likely to do is to take that fine screen and support it between two fire bricks. And for some reason, I don't knock those over. Um, these tripods, when I get a torch in there, I don't, I don't know what I do, I just knock them over. Anyway, I don't love them, but for heating underneath, they work quite well. This is a pumice pan uh, or an annealing pan. Yeah. And it, yeah. On the tripod, if you turned it over and put that heavy um, piece on the fire brick and then you put your, um, your screen on those, those three pegs, mm -hmm. would that work? Sure, if your screen is big enough. I mean, it would work. I'd probably still knock it over, although probably not as easily. Uh -huh. um, but yeah, it would work. So this is a pumice pan or an annealing pan, and it is designed for annealing. So it's got pumice rocks in there. It can also have um, some black solder sand that you see sometimes. You can also, if you want to make your own, um, get a little rotating stand, get a little, uh, I mean, it can be any cheap plastic, Lazy Susan, whatever, get a, um, a fairly deep cake pan and put kitty litter in it. And, but you want the kitty litter, not any of the fancy stuff. You want the basic, basic, basic clay kitty litter. Not, no, no scent removal or scent whatever, and no long-term and no water absorbent or any of that. You just want the plain clay kitty litter and it'll work really well too. The thing that this buys you is that you can rotate that pan and it moves around, it, it turns. And the nice thing about that is that when you're annealing, especially something like a vessel, say you've been doing um, chasing and repose and you're, you're working on a vessel, you can turn that and get all of it annealed pretty much evenly at once, rather than just annealing one spot and then another spot and then another spot and you might miss something. And so by turning it, you get even, it's even heating and you can anneal something really well. I don't like to use this when I'm soldering. I would do it very seldom. And the reason is it's not stable. I don't like things to move when I'm soldering and it is not easy always to hold this stable. And if I'm gonna hold it stable, why would I put it in a pan that rotates? Um, I have been known to take my fire brick and turn it around, but it only turns when I physically grab it and turn it. This one, 
if I touch the edge, it'll move, and then I'm not in the same position, and then, so I don't use it for soldering uh, pretty much at all. So now I want to talk to you about tools to secure things. So these are called cross-lock tweezers. I call them self-locking tweezers. So they're, they're closed unless you push them when they're open. You have a lot of choices with these. You can get blunt nose, pointed nose, curved, straight, with pads, without pads. I like the little pads. Um, those are little wooden pads. You can get little plastic pads too. I have been known to catch them on fire. Um, you can put them out, get that spray bottle that you've got for the charcoal. Uh, I like different ones for different reasons. So these are the straight nose and they're pointed. Again, pointed with no pads. Uh, this is the blunt nose ones. These are not easy to find. And I like them for soldering on um, ear posts. So what I do when I'm soldering on ear posts is I use the blunt nose tweezers, first of all, to hold the post up in the air so I can melt a little bit of solder on the end of the post. And then I use it to protect that end as I'm soldering it onto an earring. This is a stand and there's different stands that come with them, but you can get a stand with it. And this is a way you would hold on to something. So you just hold on to the top. You do need to recognize that the tweezers are going to act as a heat sink. So I do not want to hold on way down here. I want to hold on way up here if this is my solder joint so that I'm not um, adding to the heat sink. I'm not adding metal I need to heat to a point or to, to the place where I want to do my soldering. So this is with pointed, I yell like the blunt nose for this. And the reason I do is because it covers the entire tip here of the, the um, ear post. And it makes it very difficult for me to melt that ear post. If I hold on to this further down here, then my chances of melting that ear post are excellent. So next I'm gonna to talk to you about building a little setting, something like this. And what you can do with the self-locking tweezers is to carve notches in them. And I do that with a lot of my tweezers. I will carve notches in them for various jobs, depending on what I need to do. This one has a notch going this way, and this one has a notch going this way. And what that does is lets me hold on to something like this when I'm building a setting. So this is the one that has the notch going front to, goes this way, and this one has the notch going down it. And then that way I can hold on to this while I solder this. So, Deb, yeah. Deb, would you mind explaining again exactly what a heat sink is? I kind of know, but what do so, you Yeah, a heat sink is just something that we use that will absorb some of the heat away from what we're doing. Okay. And it can be tweezers, it could be a piece of sheet metal, it could be a fire brick, it could be, um, it can be all sorts of things that'll protect, it makes it harder to get heat into some part of the metal, okay? It's taking heat away. So on this one, these tweezers are definitely a heat sink over here, which is good because if I did this solder joint first, I don't want to have to, um, I don't want this to unsolder, right? And this is tiny, this is a tiny solder joint. So by holding on to it, not only am I holding on, but I'm also letting the tweezers serve as a heat sink. So what tool are you using or tools using to alter the tweezers? Um, I could use a file, they're relatively soft, but if you've got flux on your tweezers, you don't wanna do that. So probably a, um, a separating disc. Just get in there with a separating disc and cut it. So one of the things I'm gonna to talk to you about in, in just a minute is tripods, the weighted tripods. And I talked to you about that in the solder uh, cleanup lecture a little bit before. But this is one way, this is Wendy's. This is one way to make a tripod out of your self-locking tweezers is just putting a binder clip here on the end of it, right here. And then the tweezers rock. And it's got enough weight that it's gonna push a little bit of weight down on the end of it so that it's gonna to tend to hold things down. So if I put an ear post in the end of that, it's gonna to tend to hold it down. This is another way to do a similar thing. This one has a notch filed in it. And then this is just a, a kiln, a kiln piece. And it rests on there, a kiln trivet. Um, and you can make it simpler than that. The binder clip works quite well. This is one of the tripods I was telling you about. So it's got a foot there, a foot there, and a foot over in here. 
And so what you can do is just rest that point on something that you want to solder. This is the one with nails that I made that's really ugly that I will not admit to making those solder joints. But what I can do is to take that and rest it on something like this. So when I'm soldering this, this is just gentle, very gentle pressure. I don't want a lot of pressure on that ring. If I put a lot of pressure on that ring, uh, well, this one's really big, it's gonna be hard to crush, but, um, but you can crush things, uh, especially when they get, if you're using hard solder and they get really red hot. Uh, metal is really compromised at that point, our silver is. So you need to do something that's got pressure, but light pressure. So the tripod is a great answer. You can also hold things way off center. So this is the one with the nail. And you can see how this disc is up in the air. I'll show you in the next one. See how that's up in the air? That would be really hard to hold on to any other way. Um, I might be able to shove something under here, but I have no way to hold on to this edge. When I shove something under here, um, like a fire brick, then I want to be able to pin this side so that it can't just scooch down. This one holds that for me. So I don't need to hold anything here. I can just hold right there. This is another one. Say I've got a large piece of sheet metal. I want to hold a um, tube set in place. This is an easy way to do it in the middle of a sheet because they kind of can float around and go where they want. And again, it just provides very gentle pressure. This is one, so if I let go with this, if I don't have this um, tripod holding this end down, what happens is this bale will rock back and this lifts off the sheet. So then it won't solder down here. It'll only solder way back in here. So by holding this down, I can make this stay in place where I want. This is another one. Again, if I want this oriented on this sheet just exactly that way, it's going to be difficult for me to do that. Um, if I put the flux down and everything else, it's going to tend to dance around. It'll turn. You know, you go to touch something and it moves. This keeps it stable. The tripod works really well for that. T-pins. Let's talk T-pins. Um, I like my T-pins. Ideally, T-pins should be stainless steel. Uh, good luck finding those. I found some years and years ago, but I don't think they make them anymore. Uh, they will tell you that they're stainless or they'll tell you that they're steel. Uh, most of them are plated. And what that means for us is that you've got to burn the plating off first. They're either nickel plated or zinc plated. So either one of those are not good for you to breathe. You do not want to breathe them. So what I would do is to take them outside on a kiln brick and torch them until they're black and be sure that you are not downwind of the fumes. Um, they come in different sizes. I like the bigger, heavier ones. These are floral pins. Uh, floral pins come plated, but you can also get easily get ones that are not plated. Get the really cheap ones that are not plated. Um, and the thing I like about floral pins is that you can cut them. So you can cut them right through here and you can just use your regular cutters because they're just mild steel. They're really soft. You can cut them through there and then you can shape this if you want. You can make it into a little hook and then this part drops down into that honeycomb brick or gets pinned into a fire brick and the hook can hold on to whatever. You can use them whole the way they are. Um, you can get 300 for like three bucks. They're dirt cheap. This is a um, display pin and they are also plated, although you can find them in stainless. And they have a very slight curve on the top of them. They're a little bit finer, a little bit more delicate than the T-pins or the floral pins. So for things that you need a little bit more, uh, a little bit less, I guess, I guess less heat sink, um, or if you have a little bit less space to work in for whatever reason, these could work, they could be good. These are nice to know about. These are Amish hairpins. And you can get them on Etsy. I'll show you the site in just a sec. You can get them in different lengths. And they're crinkled. They say that they're stainless steel. I'm not convinced they're stainless steel. I, but maybe they are. I don't know. Uh, but they are actually pretty nice and they're pretty heavy duty. Um, here you can get bunches and bunches of different sizes and everything else. And if you just go to Etsy and you put in Amish hairpins, you will find them. Cotter pins. I love my cotter pins. I know a lot of you don't like my cotter pins, but I love my cotter pins. 
These are the ones that I recommend. Um, I've done a lot of different ones. I bought the assorted package. I've bought everything else. Cotter pins, if you go to um, Home Depot or somewhere and get them, they, I can almost guarantee they're going to be plated. And you don't want that because you have to burn the plating off and then they're going to be soft and they're going to be a mess. These are stainless steel and they are heavy duty. And even after you use them, they keep their, their springiness and their, their, you can use them multiple times. They're great. This is how I bend the basic bend for my cotter pins. Uh, so I, this is how they come up here on top. Stop that. And then I open them up like this. And then I put a little foot on this tall one. And then I put a bend right here so that it bends like that. And then I can do all kinds of things to this foot. I can make it curve. I can make it go down. I'll show you that next. So here's ones I've done other things to. See how this one curves and this one curves. This has a curved thing and a flat thing. And so, it, and if my metal, I'll say my metal piece is curved, I can make it fit my metal piece, however it needs to go to fit my metal. This is how I would use one of this curved ones. See, I'm putting two discs together. It's easy peasy for me to hold those together. That is not easy to hold together any other way. So here's some other ones. So this one you see has a little hump in it. This one has a lot bigger hump in it. This one, if anything, is bent down a little bit. This one has a curve in it. And this is how I would use one with a curve in it to put a little disc onto a flat sheet. So it's holding flat underneath with a little curve right there. So you see, I can do a lot with these cotter pins. I can, I can bend them to my will. Here is me holding on. I've shown you this one before. So I, this has a little hump in it right here. And you can see it on each one of them. That's because it's holding on this uh, half round wire right onto the edge of a sheet. And by holding in three places, I can hold that wire down quite well. Here's another view of it. You can see a little bit better, especially on this one. You can see the hump in the, the um, cotter pin that I made. And I don't, I mean, these aren't severe pressure, but they're enough pressure to hold it in place. You can see that this is held in quite well. This is a different, Dad, yeah. When you, when you have a big three solder cotter pins like that, they're a pretty big heat sink. Do you just have to uh, heat longer or turn up the heat? Well, so if you look at this, this is the big part of my piece and it doesn't have a heat sink so much. The mm -hmm. small part has the cotter pins, but they're spaced pretty well. So okay. I would still heat primarily this big piece and then heat occasionally kind of like between the cotter pins. The one thing about silver is it conducts heat really, really well. So if I get the silver hot here and here, it's gonna be hot here. Okay. This is Where do you get the cotter pins? That was my, my McMaster car. It was on a slide earlier. Oh, okay. I will, if you're on the Facebook page, I will post the cotter pin handout so that you okay. can, uh, it has all the information of where to get it. McMaster car is my best source. I like them. I can order a hundred of just the ones that I like and they're pretty reasonable. You can probably get them other places too. I don't know. Uh, so this is another one where this is square wire that I'm attaching to the edge of a, of a wire scored piece. And again, I have a straight side and then this side that has a little hump on it to hold that in place. And you can see I'm just holding the two ends. I'm holding here and here and then the middle I just made fit and that works just fine. So that kind of, I mean, in a, in a lot of ways that takes care of a lot of heat sink, but putting a wire on the edge like that, it's very difficult to hold that on any other way. So these are titanium clamps and you can make your own titanium clamps. I know that New Concepts, uh, K-N-E-W Concepts sells um, titanium strips. And I do need to tell you that I, I could not bend their titanium strips. They were too thick. And so what I ended up doing was on eBay, I ordered thinner titanium sheet and cut it and made my own strips that are significantly thinner. Um, and they work just fine. They don't lose their spring or anything else and I can work with them. I could not bend those thick ones for love nor money. I just couldn't do it. So the titanium strips do a lot of different things that are really interesting. And this is one of them. So this one, I used the little itty bitty hole punch, the one that we got from Harbor Freight in the red box. And I punched a hole in the end of the titanium strip and then the bottom is straight, but what that does is let me hold this ball in place. 
see how I can hold that in place and I can hold the ball wherever on the sheet that I want to hold it and it makes it stable and it holds it and all is well and solder won't stick to my titanium. Here's another view. This is a little one and you can see how you can use it as tweezers basically. This holds something again in the middle of a sheet. This, I can make my cotter pins do this, but I can also make the titanium do this. See how thick these are? I don't know who bent these, it wasn't me. So one thing you can do with the titanium strips that's really nice is that you can make a thing that's kind of like a solder nest, but not. So by using them up on edge like this, you can get heat underneath right here. So I can heat underneath these pieces, get the ear post soldered on just fine, and the titanium just is a little riser. And this is the last slide I have for you. This is solder clay. For any of you who have not used solder clay, it's quite the experience. It's kind of like plaster of Paris, except that it'll take high temperatures. And what you do is that you use either wax or uh, plasticine clay and oil-based clay and you position your stone settings or your pieces or whatever it is that you want to solder together exactly the way you want it. Position everything and then you build a dam around it, you mix this stuff up, pour it in, and then you peel off the wax or the, the oil-based clay and that leaves you with your solder joints with your pieces exactly where you want them and you can solder on top of it. Uh, it's not something I use often. It is something I've used. Um, I had a ring that I did for a client. She wanted, I don't even remember, seven or 10 or a lot of diamonds all on this one ring. And it was one of those swirly swoopy gold rings that getting all those settings in the right place in the right everything else was just going to be a nightmare any other way. And so what I did was to put the oil-based clay inside the ring, position all the stone settings, build the dam, use this, and then I could solder all of them at once with the clay holding on to everything exactly the way I wanted it. And it worked really well. So I think that's it for the slideshow. So do you have any questions? Are there any questions about what I went over? Deb, I had a question about what kind of mask to wear for several of the things you said we need a mask for. Um, you either need good ventilation or a mask. If you do a mask, you need to do one that's going to filter out heavy metals. And you're just going to, it's probably going to be one of those ones with the two canisters on it that you have to get the right canister to, to do the heavy metals. I, I typically don't wear a mask. What I would do is to be in a place that has really good ventilation that I know it's sucking everything away from me um, so that it's, I, I'm not breathing in those, those heavy metal fumes. And then the other thing that's not good to breathe in is um, flux fumes. And that's another one where you want it pulled away from you. You don't want a face full of flux. So like I would say the brick you said to wear a mask uh oh would... if, you're, if you're breaking it apart and that can be any kind of dust mask those particles are large so okay. you just don't want to breathe those in any anything that puts particles into your lungs is not good for you right and so you want a mask so a, a good dust mask will serve for that you just want something that'll keep that dust out of your out of your nose and mouth okay and that's only when you're breaking it apart if you're if you're breaking it apart Anything else? Yes, Deb, where do you get the Kaiser Lee block? I have some. Um, talk to me later. I have a, I have a bunch actually. Okay. Um, you can find them. If you Google Kaiser Lee board, you will find glass shops that sell them. They're usually pretty pricey, uh, but you can do that and see what you can find. Okay. See if you can, yeah. I have one foot, one foot by one foot, and they're fifty dollars. Okay. So, I you can I don't know you can see what you can find out there. You you might find something better. I I don't know. Okay, right. but Thank but you. just Google it, and it's going to be glass shops where you find it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anything else? All right. Thank you for joining me today for this session of Studio Time with Deb online. 
Uh, I will see you next week for our final one for this year or for this session, I guess. I am going to take September off. Um, I hope to be back in October. I don't know if I can make that deadline or if it's going to be November, but I will be in touch with you by email. If you know anybody who would like to join our group, have them contact me, please. And I will have them contact me at studiotimewithdeb uh, uh, at gmail, studiotimewithdeb at gmail.com. Um, and we'll go from there. Thank you.